There we go. <clears throat> All right. So it looks like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram are all live. Welcome, everybody. I love how quick we have so many people jumping on on the Instagram side. Hopefully, as we do this more, the, uh, the other platforms will become more active as well. We will just have to see. So tonight, I forgot to look, check on my brand. I think this is a Peterson pipe, but I'd have to double check. I like it because it's got this cool little camouflage. It's one of my newer pipes. It's not a really expensive one, but I just think it's cool looking. This little camo uh, mouthpiece there. And I like that it's it's tall, so I can put a lot of tobacco in it. And the uh, I got one that was camo before. It's actually on the shelf right there behind me. And I uh, the mouthpiece was just really big, and it was uncomfortable to hold my mouth. So I started looking closer at him, and I'm like, oh, yeah, because I picked the wrong one because I'm an idiot. So I got this one, and I am smoking... Cornell and Deal uh, Black Gold Maple Tobacco. So it's pretty good. I actually lit it up the other day, and my daughter walked in and goes, what smells like maple? I'm like, my tobacco. So it's kind of an aromatic. Oh, look at that. It's still burning. It's kind of an aromatic, but it's uh, still a good taste in tobacco. So I like it. All right. So... Let's go ahead and jump into everything. Oh, you know what I'm trying to do here real quick? Banners. Um, create a banner. And we say, please remember to put comments for me in all caps. Not capaz, caps. There we go. Look at that. Now, hey, I need to move this. My head's at the bottom of the screen. There we go. That's better. Now, as we're going through, I can periodically just stick that up there so that anybody who wants me to, uh, to comment on anything near the end, um, put that in all caps. If you struggle with that, just put the first one or two words in all caps, and uh, they'll catch my attention when I'm scrolling through later. So, thank you. Uh, it is nice pipe. I smoke probably way too many pipes, about three bowls a day or more sometimes. And uh, I just enjoy it. So I thought I'd share that with you guys a little bit. I probably won't have this in my mouth the whole time we're talking because it's hard to do a live stream and smoke your pipe at the same time. Okay, so let's go ahead with the recording for today. Um, we're also going to be addressing a few extra little things um, in our... Um, before we get into the, the main topic, I've got a few extra things I'm going to throw in there and I'll try and start making that kind of part of what we do every week. So with that, here we go. Hello and welcome to the Protection Dog Podcast. This is episode 106, where we provide an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to talk about Thinking for yourself. Thinking for yourself. It's dangerous. Be careful thinking for yourself. We'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, I am drinking today, if you're on my live stream, Celsius. I don't know if I like them as much as Monster, but somebody gave me like six or eight flats of them. So um, while I'm I'm spreading them out between my Monster and these to make them last a little bit longer. So I do like, though, when I'm talking... Uh, these aren't as bubbly, even though they say sparkling on them. They're they're pretty smooth. So sometimes when I uh, sip a monster while I'm talking, if I don't kind of pause and make sure I swallowed it all the way down, the bubbles get in my throat, and I'm like uh, uh, a little bit feeling when I'm trying to talk. You like that sound? I'm I'm a specialist at sound effects. So before we jump into today's topic, though, setting my pipe down over there. Let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Canine Academy Online. So Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy. We have local and online training. Our local training is located in the Orlando, Florida, and the Houston, Texas areas. Um, you can contact me directly uh, for training in the Orlando area. And if you're interested in training in um, the Houston area, you can contact Pat. And his handle on Instagram is at Canine Philosophy. Um, 
And if you want his uh, other contact information, you can always send me an email and I can send that over to you. We cover things like obedience, service dog training. We have tracking, protection, and tactical training. And uh, you can find out more information by visiting our website, K9, that's the letter K, the number nine, academyonline.com. You can also email me, Joel, J-O-E-L, at K9academyonline.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube uh, by searching for K9 Academy Online. So basically what we do here is we have, uh, I just got this puppy, I don't know what to do with it, all the way up through off-lead obedience, and then some uh, really advanced stuff is being built into it now. So there's lots of different stuff there, uh, something for everybody. It covers our training philosophy, and uh, and we're trying to continue to add to that as we go on. I'm also getting ready. It probably won't be live until June or July, uh, but I am uh, glancing at my calendar there again. I am getting ready to um, to give it a facelift. Uh, I found an app, uh, a plugin actually for my WordPress app that. Um, Kind of gives it uh, a much more usable, user-friendly uh, interface. So that's going to be a little bit of work. I'm probably going to have to lock myself in my office for like two weeks to get that done. But um, I'll be moving all the videos and everything over into that the new platform. And then once that's live, I'll um, I'll turn off all the pages that are currently used and turn on all the new pages. And uh, there might be a few hiccups, excuse me, in the very initial startup there. But uh, I think you guys will enjoy it a lot better. Um, so also just a quick note about puppy sales. We do have some German Shepherd Malinois cross puppies left. That's pretty much it. I may have one Mally and one Dutchie left. Um, but I have so many people reaching out to me about those that, um, I don't know that they'll be here for much longer, but if you are interested in a Malinois Dutch Shepherd, uh, or a German Shepherd cross, uh, contact me. You can text me. Remember, do not call me, text me at 813-836-9244 and let me know you're interested in a puppy and uh, I will start getting you the information there. Okay, so one thing I'm gonna try and start adding into all of these is a what's new on the dog farm. So if you guys followed all of my platforms previously, I was running an Instagram page and trying to do a um, podcast for what I called Fortress Survival and that was kind of a, um, it was, protection focused, but it was also covering things like, um, you know, how to do farmsteading stuff, how to do camping and uh, some of your more, um, uh, what do you call it, off grid type stuff. And um, it just got too much to do altogether. So I figured one way I could kind of bring some of that in a little bit is kind of uh, going over and discussing some of the things we're doing here on our dog farm. For those of you who don't know, uh, I have a full breeding program here on the um, the Fortress Canine facility. So we have a training field, we have a kennel, and uh, and we have a, a large, uh, well, not a large breeding program, but a pretty decent breeding program. Um, anywhere between 20 and 40 dogs on ground at any given time, uh, and we rarely get down to 20. And so uh, we have a lot of stuff going on here. Hey, Peter, how you doing, man? And, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to cover some of the stuff that we have going on. So I've talked previously about our hydro system that we built based on a guy named Jack Spearco. Uh, if you go look him up on YouTube, Jack Spearco, um, he has a hydroponics growing system for growing things like lettuces and leafy greens and things like that. And so I tried to, to copy that, but it didn't exactly work out the way I'd planned. So I had to modify it a little bit. Uh, but it's still very closely based on his system. Highly, highly effective, awesome uh, production. We're in the process of restarting it right now. I also used it this year for seed starting um, for the front garden beds. So uh, that's been reset. And uh, and I'll try and get you guys some videos out on all the platforms, including um, the uh, YouTube platform. I'll try and do some smaller, shorter videos on that more frequently. But um when that gets going, I'll get some of those videos up for you. But we just recently moved over the seed starts out to the front garden bed. So we have the front garden beds have some tomatoes, uh, squash, and um, we didn't get a lot of germination in some of the stuff. I didn't really do a careful germination process. I just stuck a bunch of seeds in the starters and was like, whatever starts, starts, because we've been in and out uh, doing travel the last several months. So we got some decent stuff and we got that going. We're going to add a few more tomatoes. We've got some heirloom cherry tomatoes uh, in the starter now and they're popping up. So we'll get those into the ground when we get back from this next trip. 
And um, so those are the things we got going on. I'm going to try to also start having uh, some pictures and, and or some short videos of that stuff that I can hop in and play here for you. Um, but because I'm getting ready to leave tomorrow, I've been running around all day today, packing an RV and getting things ready. So I did not have time to do that, but that is something I'm going to try to start adding in. Also, we talked uh, several weeks ago about doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the K9 helmet versus the Dark Systems helmet. Uh, I wanted to give you an update on that because it's been a little while since um, it came up and I was expecting to do this sooner. Uh, so I've got my K9 helmet. But both of these um, companies are, they're very, um, they're focused on like doing large orders, things like the military and stuff like that. So when you're only ordering one or two at a time, uh, you have to kind of wait for one of the big orders to come in and then they just kind of add you into that order and then ship yours out uh, separately. So um, Dark Systems, I'm still waiting on their helmet system to show up. Uh, so I've not forgotten about it. I'm just waiting for that system to show up. I do have my canine helm. Uh, system here already. Uh, I actually just got my second one because uh, they did some upgrades to it and I wanted to get one with the new upgrades. And then um, as soon as the Dark Systems one gets here, I will get that going. Um, when I made this slide, I'm sure I had something in mind when I wrote this down, but now I can't remember it. Whiskey, I like it a lot. It was probably because uh, on my front slide, I have what am I drinking and what am I smoking today? And um, I don't usually, I stay here at the kennel several nights a week just because it makes my life easier. Um, and on those nights I drink here, but normally Thursday night is not one of those nights. And so I don't typically uh, have a drink while I'm doing this because I drive home right after. And uh, even though I like my whiskey a lot, I don't drink it and then drive around. So that would be stupid. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to do, I will do these periodically as they come in, uh, but I got an email uh, that is a topic that I get asked a lot. And uh, so I thought I would just go ahead and address that here. Um, the person that sent it knows that I'm doing this and I will send her a, uh, a link to this when I get done. Um, I will come back to that uh, question on the Mutt Muffs later. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and run through this with you. Okay, so I'm going to abbreviate some of the stuff in the email because it's a little bit lengthy, but it, it's good information. I'm just not going to belabor all of the fine points with you. So basically, uh, somebody found us through our podcast and Canaan Academy Online. Uh, they've listened to a bunch of the podcasts here, and um, and they've decided they want to get themselves a dog. Right? Um, however, after listening to the podcast, now they're like, I don't think I want to do the reward with treats and toys. I want to follow your method a little better. Uh, which we do cover all of how we do that on Canine Academy online. And um, and then they said they've had dogs all their life, retriever mixes, um, but they decided to get a German Shepherd puppy, which we have some available if you want to get one from us. Uh, but if you already have it set up with somebody else, that's fine. Um, they've been dreaming about this for a long time, and they're motivated by the idea of having a strong bond. They were originally thinking about doing IPO. That's one of the sports with the dogs, which of the sports, that is a better one. I will say that. Um, you know, not all the sports are created equal. And um, oh, somebody said something the other day that was pretty funny. Oh, they were talking about they were joking about conspiracies and uh, lizard people. And they said lizard people are people, too. Um, so when you talk about sports, you know, sports people are still people, too. Um, and if you're going to do a sport, IPO is not terrible. Um, but you're you're probably not going to get the actual fight. Right. They do. a They do a more intense job in their bite work, typically, though. Um, and we've had dogs go into those sports. People buy them from us and, and send them into those, and they do pretty good in those sports. Um, but basically, one of the perks is if they get the dog protection train, uh, their husband doesn't like to do outdoorsy stuff, but she does, and so he'll feel more comfortable with her going backpacking and hiking and things like that. Uh, so question number one is, in terms of protection work, they're, they're saying there's nobody around me that does the non-sport type protection. Uh, they live in the Atlantic Canada area, and they are wondering um, how does it work if they come down here and train with me? Um, can they do their protection training down here with me? Okay, so I get and I get this question in different variations all the time. Sometimes people buy a puppy and then they're like, "Oh crap! I wish I'd known about you sooner." Um, but can I come train with you? Some people want a protection dog but can't afford the full protection price, so they buy a puppy and then they come. And, uh, and they want to do the protection work with us um, as they go, which if you have time but not money, that is a good option. If you have money 
more money than you have time, then buying a trained dog is a better option, right? That's kind of how I normally describe it to people. Um, I am not affiliated with these uh, people, but there is, so people always ask me, is there a place near me that does this kind of training? Um, and 99% of the time I have to say, no, there is not, or at least not one that I know about. Uh, but I can tell you in Atlantic Canada, especially if you're still having trouble crossing the border, I know that was a big deal several months ago. I don't know if it's still the case. Um, but there is a company, Baden K9, B-A-D-E-N K9, uh, and they are in the St. Anne area near Ontario. Um, uh, Ontario is the, under the big province. They're near Niagara Falls area. Um, they're up, up inland a little bit from Niagara Falls. So um, they're in that general area. So if they are closer and easier for you, um, they are awesome. They are awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, you can tell them I sent you or not. Doesn't matter. They're probably not going to give you a discount. Um, I don't know if they think too highly of me, but they are a good company um, in terms of they train amazing dogs. They breed amazing dogs. They're a good place to connect with. Um, but if you want to come down here and uh, do your training, here's how it works. So people are always like, how long do I need to spend down there to do this? Um, that totally depends on you and your dog, right? So step number one is if you're getting a puppy is get your puppy and get a really good foundation in your puppy. Uh, by foundation, I mean uh, get them a lot of socialization, uh, a lot of stabilization, get them out in public, get them moving around uh, other dogs in a disciplined, controlled way, not at a dog park running loose and being crazy, and um, and get their, their obedience really good, right? And you should be able to do that in about four to six months if you're putting uh, time and energy into your dog. And some people can do it even a little bit quicker than that if they're really dedicating themselves to it. Then once you have that, I recommend setting up like a three day training with us. So that's uh, probably coming down for like a Thursday, Friday, and then doing a Saturday class with us. And we will start working your dog, okay? Every dog is a little bit different. Some dogs come out really fast, some dogs come out slower, right? Uh, a lot of that has to do with the intensity of the handler. And uh, so a, a handler that's um, more of the mindset of defending themselves will probably have their dog come out faster, typically. And a uh, handler that's a little more timid um, will typically, not always, have their dog come out a little bit slower. Um, but they will, they, I've never had a dog not come out in protection work, right? So when you're doing this, um, you know, I would plan for it to be um, probably a minimum of four of these sessions. Um, doing a three days uh, coming and we train basically as much as your dog can handle it um, for those three days, up to six hours a day, okay? And, uh, and doing that for at least doing it four times, you'll have a really, really good understanding of where you are at that point and whether it's something you want to continue investing in, right? And then um, question number two is they say, regardless of whether uh, the true protection work is possible for me. I plan on using your training for my dogs. Um, there was a question about using good in front of the command. So when we praise our dogs, if I say seats, when the dog sits, I say good seats, right? Or good plots if they're walking by my side, good hop when they jump up on things, all of that sort of thing. So when we are talking about um, doing this, this person heard somewhere that this can confuse the dog because you're saying the command again, right? Um, I've been training dogs for almost 20 years. I've trained hundreds of dogs and I have had exactly zero dogs be confused by saying good and the command. Now, part of saying good in the command, you're using the word good and the command, right? But they have to learn that that's praise. So in the beginning, they don't know that that's praise, but you're vocal the way you say it, good plus, right? You say it like, I'm happy with you. Good job. You did good. And um, even if you're frustrated with the dog and you had to fight them into a position, sometimes with the puppies, they're like, no, I'm not going to go into a putz. And you basically got to put them in the putz, right? And then you say, good putz. And then if they get up, you put them back down in the putz and you say, good putz, right? And you're talking to them calmly, gently, nicely, um, and letting them know you're happy with them. And we want to reinforce the word because I want them to know you're being praised for plutzing. And that this is part of the process of showing them what plutz means. But you're being rewarded for plutzing, praised for plutzing. You're not being praised for something else, right? You're not being praised for looking over there at that squirrel and thinking about running and chasing it. You're being praised for laying down when I told you to lay down. So um, I have never had a dog be confused by that. Um, I will say this. Uh, there's a lot of sucky dog trainers out there, 
And so if they can't figure out how to communicate with dogs and their dogs get confused, that is probably more the trainer than the dogs. Um, okay. And then question number three, do I play with my dogs? So, um, I personally don't do much play with them because they love to work. My dogs love working. I take them out on the field and they're like, woo, we're getting to do fun stuff. I get to bite people and climb on obstacles and do all this fun stuff. And uh, so I don't need to play with them, but a lot of people want to play with them. So here's what I recommend with play. And this is also in the Canine Academy. And I actually have a couple of videos that show you some of this in the Canine Academy. But if I'm doing fetch with my ball, right? I'm throwing a ball or my dog. I'm throwing a ball with my dog. They're going to run, get it, and bring it back. First of all, I go through the process of actually showing them. Uh, I use get it. So I throw the ball and I tell them get it. Now I have to show a dog how to get it. So when they're little, um, if you just kind of drop the ball on the ground and kick it around a little bit and they start chasing it and jumping on it and biting at it, I start telling them, good, get it, good, get it. Had a girl, good, get it. And then as soon as they can actually pick it up, I will start encouraging them to bring it to me. And then when they bring it, I say, good, bring it, good, bring it. And then I put my hands on it, tell them out, right? Or leave it and they're to let go, okay? And I, I introduce and teach them all three of those things. Get it, bring it, and let's let go, out. And then I just get them into the, the game. So, you know, in a safe place where they're not gonna get run over by a car or anything like that, we uh, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. And I'll get them used to that for maybe a month, right? And then pretty quickly, once they have that down really good, and I know that the you know, introducing more obedience isn't going to make them lose interest in chasing the ball, I start putting obedience into that exercise. So I'll throw the ball a couple times, let them go get it, let them bring it back. Then I'll put them in a sit next to me and I'll say, wait, leave it. And I'll throw the ball. Now, this is probably the first time they've been told to do that in relation to the ball. And so the first time they're probably going to break position. Now, I'm going to make sure I have the lead on. I'm holding their lead in my hand because I'm expecting that they're not going to wait for me because they're still young and they're all excited about chasing this ball around. And I'm going to correct them and put them back if they chase the ball. If they sit there and they don't move, I go, good, leave it. All right, go get it. Right. And I start putting variations of that. And we cover that in more detail in the Canine Academy. But I start putting variations of that into um, the game so that even the game and they're just having fun and running and getting the ball and it's so much joy for them but even that is having obedience built into it okay so that is how i do that all right now we're jumping into the main topic for today so i saw this quote somewhere on social media uh, it was either me we float or instagram something like that and i did not write down who said it so i'm sorry i didn't come up with this word um I think it was on one of those. There's a couple of places I follow that are like philosophers and they, they put quotes from philosophers up a lot. But what the person said was to be alone is the fate of all who think for themselves. And if somebody will put who said that, if you know, into the, um, the comments, I'll give them credit for that. But to be alone is the fate of all who think for themselves. So especially lately with all of the craziness of the cancellations and, um, people basically being badgered into group think, sheep think, follow whatever you're told kind of stuff. Um, this has become more and more relevant. So I saw that and I was like, that is a podcast episode we're gonna do right there. So thinking for yourself is dangerous. It's dangerous to you, it's dangerous to those closest to you, and it's dangerous to the establishment. Now, why is it dangerous? Well. It's dangerous for a couple of reasons. Number one, in today's world, um, if you rely on social media or you rely on any place where you can be quote unquote canceled, um, speaking, thinking for yourself and saying something about it um, can have detrimental effects to your career and other things like that, right? Now, if you do kind of what I do and I built myself a cancel free or cancel resistant uh, set up because I don't fucking care what you think about me, right? And so uh, everybody who listens to me and continues to listen to me, a lot of people are like, they're new, and then they're like, yep, this guy's not for me, and they leave, and good riddance, that's fine. You don't have to like me. Um, but I wanted to be like that from the very beginning, so I was never putting on some kind of pretense that then I could do something to accidentally mess it up, right? I am who I am. Like me, don't like me. I don't care, um, but hopefully I can help some people, right? That's how I've built this. But if you haven't done that in your life yet, then beginning to think for yourself starts to create a danger for you, right? Uh, it can be a danger for those close to you because a lot of times family uh, or other, you know, uh, if you're run a business or something like that, your employees, 
uh, could be at risk for this sort of thing and to the establishment, which is why they're banning people, right? They're getting people off these platforms or they're shadow banning them, doing all of that sort of thing. So um, it's important when we start talking about thinking for ourselves that we understand this is not something that's danger, that has no danger associated with it, right? There is definitely danger associated with thinking for yourself. Um, there's also what happens a lot of times if if you have been a person who's thought for yourself your whole life, or if you become a person who's who thinks for yourself, a lot of times what you do is you find yourself in these situations where you're alone in a room of your peers or family, right? You can be around lots of people and everybody around you can't think for themselves. And you, once you wake up to thinking for yourself, it's almost impossible to go back to sleep about it. And so then you become, uh, and you have this issue of, you almost can't talk to people around you because everybody else is just asleep, right? They don't want to talk about it. Or if they do, they just get mad uh, or they start throwing around, you know, the little uh, statements that are whatever the popular statement is at the time, you know, instead of um, calling the Florida um, bill that was said, hey, you can't teach sex ed to, to three third graders and below. Uh, and instead of discussing the topics, uh, they say, oh, it's a don't say gay bill. And, and now don't say gay is a thing, right? And um, it's like, no, they're third graders and below. We probably shouldn't be exposing them to sexuality at that age. And if their parents want to do it, they can decide to do it. Um, but they, they create these little um, snapshots, right? These little phrases, these little things that are easy to remember. And, uh, and they're typically, they induce some kind of emotion in people. And, um, and so you find yourself surrounded by people who this is the, the best they can do. Right? This is the best they can think, and, uh, and that makes you very, very alone in the things that you're doing. So um, how do you deal with your thoughts when you become a person who thinks for yourself and you're surrounded by sheep? So you have basically uh, two approaches that you can have here. You can have the sheepdog, okay? And I think this idea came from uh, Jack Spierko, if I remember correctly. Um, it was like two or three things all happened here together to bring some of these thoughts together in my mind. But, uh, so if, if that was him, I want to make sure I give him credit for it, but you have the sheepdog mentality and the sheepdog mentality is this, the sheepdog is out among the sheep. The sheepdog can't really interact with the sheep. There, there's a little bit of interaction, but not like it would interact with other dogs, right? So the sheepdog, even though it's not alone, it is alone because it's the only one there. And you can take that approach. The sheepdog just lays down, chills out, has its own thoughts, watches over its flock, but it, it doesn't really interact with the sheep. And you can do that. If you decide to try to interact with the sheep, the other approach is the teacher approach. And if you're, so this is not the argument approach. If you just wanna argue, then you can argue, but you're probably, no one's ever agreed with someone else because that person yelled at them, right? Even if you quote unquote win an argument, that doesn't mean that that person is going to agree with you. In fact, it means that they're more likely to still disagree with you just because they don't like the fact that they quote lost, right? And didn't have an answer. So when you take the approach of teacher, you have a couple of different things you can do. Number one is you stay calm and you just give information to somebody and see if they can start to chew on it, right? That one is, I believe, not quite as effective, but it is one of the options. The one that I think is much more effective, I'm not necessarily great at it, but I've seen other guys do it and they are really, really good at it. If you practice it, I'm sure you get good and it works pretty well, and that is you ask questions. So when someone says, um, you know, whatever, you know, Trump was Hitler, whatever they say, you know, and um, then you just start asking questions. And, uh, you know, I'll just use that example since that was the first one to pop into my head. And you can say, that's an interesting idea. Um, do you know how many people Hitler killed in World War II? And uh, you may not know, 
right? Uh, you don't have to know all the answers to the questions that you ask, um, but you can say, I'm pretty sure it was somewhere in the 600,000 range um, of just Jews, I think, that were killed in the concentration camps. And it was like over a million total other people. And, uh, and then I would go, do you know how many people Trump has killed? Right. And I'm not I'm not an any politician supporter. Um, I think Trump did better than a lot of other people. But I in generally I in general despise all politicians. So I'm not pro anything here. I am just saying when you get into these things, you go um, asking questions about how to think for yourself forces the other person to either disengage pretty quickly. Right. Or they start really, they have to think through a response to what you said. Now they may some, say something stupid, right? They may just throw back one of these little uh, phrases that are popular at the time, but then you can use that opportunity to ask about that phrase. You know, does the bill say, don't say gay? Like what does the bill actually say? And of course, 99% of the time, they don't know. They don't know what the bill says. I didn't read the bill. I only talked to a couple of people that have you know, are more into it than me because my kids don't go to school. So I don't deal with that. We homeschool our kids. So I don't care, right? I separate myself from those things. So I don't have to worry about that. But the idea here is when you start thinking for yourself, you, and you decide you want to try and interact with other people, taking the teacher role and being willing to, to take feedback, right? Um, so sometimes the other person is actually thoughtful as well, but you just disagree. And so they may take some of the teacher role and you may take some of the teacher role and it may be a back and forth. One is teaching and then the other is teaching, right? And you're both learning from each other and growing. And those are actually, they generally turn into really great conversations. Okay. But try, I, I would recommend not just arguing for the sake of arguing. When I was in college, that was all I wanted to do is just argue about everything. But I've always been a person who thought outside the box, um, who thought differently than most other people. And so it always created a situation where there was always something to argue about. And so that kind of stuff would happen frequently. Um, the other part is be willing to admit that you're wrong or don't know something. So this is, this is what happened with me. I'll just say what happened with me. When I first started thinking for myself and really digging into certain topics. Um, you know, I got into things like, um, is Christianity true or not? Like that, I took a real skeptical approach to Christianity and started working through, well, uh, how do we know that the Bible is actually God's word? And, um, you know, what about all these errors that people say are in the historical records and all that sort of thing? I started going through all that, right? And then you start to develop opinions when you start getting into these things. And then you begin to fill in your gaps of knowledge with assumptions based on the little bit of information you have. And then you get into a, a discussion or a debate with somebody, right? Or you're teaching and they ask you a question back and they ask you a question about something you don't know the answer to. And it's very easy, especially early on when you get into this, um, because you, you don't want to appear like you don't know what you're talking about, right? Or you don't want to be wrong because you're starting to work it, you know, in a kind of a countercultural way. And all of a sudden, you just spout out your assumption when you don't know anything, right? You don't know. You're just assuming. Now, maybe you're really good at deductive reasoning and your assumption is, is not far off. Excuse them well. But maybe the other person actually knows the answer to the question they're asking. And now you look like an idiot. So be willing to admit, number one, if you are wrong, right? If they say, uh, I don't think that information is correct. Go, well, maybe I'm wrong. Why don't we look it up, right? Why don't we check it out? If that's something that's possible to do at that moment. Or if they ask you a question, it's fine to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, right? Uh, that's an interesting topic. I haven't considered that before. I'll have to give that some thought before I can give you a response because you brought up a new idea in our conversation that I hadn't considered previously, right? So, but in order to do that, in order to have that conversation, you have to be willing to admit that you are either wrong or don't know something. And when you start to think for yourself, you're probably going to get challenged by other people and being willing to be honest with them. That's really what that is, is being honest and not being deceitful will go a long, long way, especially if you're trying to help other people be uh, thinkers for themselves. 
And then be willing to learn from others. Now here's a hard part, and this is something that a lot of people, including myself, struggle with a lot. Finished off that Celsius, it's all done. Is learning from the sheep, right? So I have friends that in many ways think for themselves and in many other ways, um, and this is probably how we all are in various different um, areas, and in other ways, they, they really think for themselves in certain things. But they will um, often be better read on a specific topic than I am. And I will um, have information on a topic like the Russia-Ukraine thing, right? I don't know everything that's going on in Russia-Ukraine, but I have some information about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. And uh, some of the information I have is not in the mainstream media, Right. Like the fact that there's true Nazis uh, militias running around Ukraine being funded by the Ukraine government. Now, that doesn't make Russia right. Right. It just makes both sides wrong. So I am not a fan. I hate all war. I don't think war is something we should be doing unless it's absolutely 100 percent necessary. Um, something like World War Two. And even then, uh, probably the way we went about it wasn't as good as it could have been. But it is what it is. I can't change it. Um, but you get into these situations and you go, I know a little bit about what's going on over there, but I don't know everything. And so when you start to talk to somebody who, as far as you could tell, they're like a Fox News person, right? If you're on the conservative side, a lot of people think Fox News is the truth. And I'm like, Fox News is just as bad as CNN. They're just making you feel like you have a choice. They all lie to you. They all have a narrative that they're pushing and none of them are giving you the actual news. It just makes you feel better. Now, there may be one or two people on Fox News that are okay, but I don't even watch Fox News. I could give two craps about those people um, because when I have watched them, I'm like, you're just as freaking messed up as everybody else. So I don't listen to any of those people. But um, you'll be talking to this person that you might consider a sheep, especially on the topic at hand. And, uh, and they're just giving you all the media stuff, right? And you don't even have to watch the media to know what the media is saying because it's all over the Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. You see it everywhere, right? And you're like, you kind of think to yourself, this person, I've got to like explain this stuff to them again and blah, blah, blah. And why am I even wasting my time? Is it even worth it? And then you'll start to, to have a discussion. You'll start to talk and you'll ask a question and they'll give you information you didn't hear, you didn't know before. And sometimes in, immediately we go, that's not true. But we always need to ask ourselves, do we know if something is true or not? And if we don't know if it's not true, then don't automatically assume it's not true. Or I like this approach. I automatically assume, especially if the mainstream media is telling me something, it's not true. But then I go and I try and check to see if it's not true. Um, and I'm going to put a little note in here because I don't want to lose this. But... Um, That just reminded me about something. Okay. Um, so you're doing uh, your stuff you're going through. Make sure if this happens to you, you're talking to someone and they present new information. You may assume it's not true, but don't allow that to destroy the conversation. Um, say, I don't know about that. I haven't heard that before. That's a new piece of information to me. I have to consider that. Right? Be willing to learn even from the sheep and be constantly improving yourself. So I got into this a lot more in detail in one of my older episodes. It was like one of the first 20, I think. We were talking about kind of how to think about different things. And one of the things we uh, did a lot of discussion on was never be afraid to be wrong. And one of the things that really keeps us from learning, that keeps us from developing ourselves and improving is we're afraid to be wrong. And so we don't even consider that that could be a possibility. Right. And what that does is it, it keeps us from considering alternative viewpoints and ideas. So if I'm wrong, I want to know I'm wrong. That it might not be comfortable to be wrong. Right. I might not like it if I'm wrong, but I still want to know I'm wrong so that I can be right because I want to be right. Right. I want to know and think. I want to know what I'm talking about. I want to think about things properly and the opinions and positions I hold. I want those to be right. But guess what? I have positions that aren't right, but I don't know which ones they are though. Cause all the positions I hold, I think are right. Right. But you have positions that you're not right about. And the problem is we get so stuck in left or right. 
um, conservative or liberal, um, you know, black and white and on the racial side. Right. And, and people try to, to create separation and then force you into one group or another. But what you find when you start thinking for yourself is, you know, on every issue, there's this side. Let me see if I, ooh, there we go. I'm in the middle. Now. There's this side and this side. And I always fall somewhere in here in the middle. Now I might be a little closer on this direction or a little closer on that direction, but I don't believe either side. I think Republicans are pieces of crap and I think Democrats are pieces of crap. And in general, I think most people on the far, far left, especially are bigger pieces of crap, but most people that claim to be on the right probably really aren't. And what is really even the right when you get into a lot of these topics, right? So I find myself going, you know what uh, conservatives need a lot more of? Compassion. You know what liberal people need a lot more of? Logic, right? And so I'm I'm never on a side. Um, I'm always, no matter who I'm talking to, I'm always like, yeah, you're too far over there. And and I, I'm trying to you know find the balance between these things two things, right? So you end up getting trapped if you think you're always right. So whenever you have a conversation, you should probably view success in that conversation. If at the end of the conversation, I either have learned something new uh, that now I can consider and and incorporate into my thinking, right? Um, I had an idea that I'd not previously considered presented to me or I modified slightly one of my positions based on our conversation. If one of those three things happened, that was probably a pretty good conversation, right? Because uh, when I first started getting into this and actually being open to the idea of being wrong, which took me a long time, right? I started thinking of myself, but then I still got super opinionated about all this stuff. And then one day something happened and I was wrong. I knew I was wrong. I still defended the position, but I couldn't shake it. I was like, I know that they were right and I was wrong. And so I started opening my mind a little bit and it was a slow, gradual process, but to wanting to know more and more, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, I want to know. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm wrong. Challenge my position. I wanted to have my positions challenged in a good way so that I could start getting closer and closer to what was actually right. Right. So, um, this is a slight side thing, but it's, it popped into my head when I was just talking and it's worth being aware of. So one of the things that both of the sides in the media do, right? And of course, most of the media is way over on the left and then you have Fox News or on the right and, uh, and whatever, you know, Daily Wire and, and all these other guys that are basically regurgitating the news um, is start looking for pattern recognition. And one of the most common patterns is this. There's an accusation and the accusation is true, but the mainstream media, what they will do is they will change the accusation just slightly and then say it's not true. So examples, Um, the Biden administration is passing out crack pipes to, I guess it was homeless people or whoever they were passing them out to. And the news media creates a headline that says, Biden administration is not passing out crack pipes and heroin. And so you see, they change the accusation, crack pipes and heroin. And then they say, that's not true. And people go, oh, well, it's not true. I guess they like, they looked it up and they said, it's not true. But that the statement that they said isn't true, but the crack pipes are true, right? There are people that actually got these, they call them like little uh, health kits or whatever. And there was soap and toothbrush and toothpaste and other things. And then a crack pipe. Right. And I guess a meth pipe, too. And I, I didn't know there were two different pipes. I was a cop, too, for years, and I still didn't know that. But uh, I'm not into the drug scene and I was never in vice. So I, I didn't have a lot to do with the drugs. I also personally don't think drugs should be illegal. I think you, I don't want to do them. I don't think most people, most other people should do them. Uh, but I think the government doesn't have any business telling you what you can consume. Anyway, that's my opinion. So pattern recognition. So they'll do that kind of thing. Right. Uh, there was another one. Oh, the bio labs in Ukraine. Okay. So there was a bio labs thing in Ukraine. And so this comes out, the accusation is there are us funded bio labs in Ukraine and they change the, um, the statement, the accusation to there are no us funded bio weapons labs in Ukraine. So you see how they do that. So this is a pattern to be aware of. Now here's why I, I was like, I've noticed those patterns in the past, 
but it never worked on me because I so distrust the official story. When I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, every story that came out was false that I had direct knowledge of. And from that point forward, I've never trusted the media with anything they've said ever again. It's not that they always lie. I just assume they're lying until it's proven otherwise. But um, because here's what I would do with the pattern. They would go, the Biden administration isn't passing out crack pipes and heroin. That's not true. And I'd go, they're passing out heroin too? Wow, that's even worse, right? They would go, there's not bioweapons labs that are US funded in Ukraine. And I'd go, they're actually weapons labs? Wow, that's crazy. So I would always assume the addition was also true rather than assuming the story was um, not true because the media said it wasn't true. So that's something that I've had to recognize, right? And go, oh, I see what they're doing. That doesn't mean that that's also true. It just means this is a deception that they're using to keep you from um, from believing these true accusations that are being made in different places. So, all right. So that's all I have on that. Um, start thinking for yourself. I know it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous for yourself, but don't allow yourself because of that to stop thinking for yourself. Now, be smart in how you do it especially when you start interacting with other people. Um, you don't want to just run around. Like if you're on a platform that you're going to get canceled on, uh, before you start running around, make sure you have alternative platforms and you pushed your people in that direction. If you have people following you, like follow me on Odyssey, follow me on Float, follow me on MeWe, because if Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube get mad at me, um, then you know that may be the only place you can go to find me, right? So that sort of thing. Um, but don't allow that to keep you from thinking for yourself. And as you start thinking for yourself, just remember a lot of the people around you are not going to be thinking for themselves. And it's going to feel lonely um, when you start to interact. If you're going to take the teacher's role, which is a good role to take, being a sheepdog, it's really hard being lonely, right? Um, and, and it creates a, you can almost fall into a depression doing that. Why doesn't anybody else get it? Why am I the only one who sees this? Am I the only one who sees this? Am I actually crazy because I'm the only one who sees this? So when you take on the teacher role, it creates more interaction. And then you can start to see, ah, I'm right here, but not there. Okay, I still need to make modifications here. And even the sheep can teach me things, but you'll also help to start getting these other people to think for themselves. And then make sure you're willing to admit that you're wrong if you don't know something and be willing to learn from others as you start going through. And um, and that pattern recognition one was just a nice little um, benefit, little perk there. All right, so I'm scrolling through comments here and uh, looks like we got good stuff going on. Nice pipe, thanks, I like it too. I'll try and, and I have like, I. I Total pipes. Let me see real quick. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. I got at least 27 pipes. I probably have about 30 pipes because I have a couple in the truck in my little travel pouch. So, um, and I have about five that I really like. So I'll try and do a better job um, mixing those up a little bit so you guys can see some of those because some of them are really cool. Um, yeah, the, you know, I don't know what I think about this. Um, who is that? It's uh, Bernard Carey. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. And uh, they're, they're okay. I think they have a few more carbs in them than uh, the monsters do. I'm trying to review it now and I don't know where to look. Anyway, um, we'll see. I got a couple of them, so I'll drink them till they're gone and then I probably won't really get any more. I like the monsters better. Um, Okay, do the Mutt Muffs work well with the K9 helmet? Um, okay, if you have Mutt Muffs, I've not used Mutt Muffs directly. So I am going off of uh, people that I've talked to that have used them and the images that I've seen and stuff like that. So the folks over at Rec Specs um, have said that the Mutt Muffs are they're effective, they work, uh, they're difficult to keep in place. And what people have found is if you put the Rec Specs over the Mutt Muffs, the Rex Specs straps kind of hold the Mutt Muffs in place better. And for those that aren't familiar, Mutt Muffs are a hearing protection that's just like these. It looks kind of like the ones that humans wear. Um, they're, they're more triangular shaped than oval, but they have straps on them that kind of strap to the dog's head, right? And, uh, and hold them in place. And so uh, everything I've heard is they do work well in terms of muffling noise. Um, they can be difficult to keep in place depending on the shape of the dog's head. And... 
Rex Specs has come out with their own version of hearing protection. Um, I've put it on my dogs a couple of times. I've not actually used it around loud noises to see how effective it is, but it's basically a neoprene tube with pieces of foam sewn inside of it. And it's like, there's a piece of foam and then there's a, there's a, like if my hand's a piece of foam and then there's a little extra piece of foam that's got a cut out in the middle that's um, glued to it. So it, it kind of sits with a little cavity underneath it. And um, that looks like it'll work better uh, in terms of staying in place. I don't know how well it works in terms of muffling sound. Now, when it gets to combining these things with the canine helmet, um, I would say, and again, I've not done this personally because I don't actually use mutt muffs. I use the, um, the hearing protection on the canine helmet for my dogs when I'm doing this is I don't think it would work well. So the simple answer is I don't think it would work well. I think um, the way that the canine helmet sets, it, it actually is up probably between a quarter and a half inch from the dog's head to the top of the helmet, depending on where it's at. But around the ears, it's probably about a quarter to a half inch. And so number one, I don't know that it would seal well in that area. And I don't know if you've ever fired a gun wearing hearing protection with the seal broken. Um, it's substantially, it allows a substantial amount of noise in through that broken seal, right? That's actually why I'm mostly deaf um, was in Iraq. We had uh, our, our headset on that we would communicate in the vehicle and via our radios. And, um, and when we, I would shoot the M60 or the 240 Bravo is what we were carrying then. Um, when you put your ear, your head against the stock, it would break the seal on my right side. And then I basically had no hearing protection on there when I was firing live. And uh, so if you break that seal, you lose a lot of the hearing protection that's there. Now, K9 Helm has, I don't know how much muffs cost. I think the hearing protection that actually attaches to the K9 helmet is like 160 bucks, something like that. So it's not cheap, but if you're doing a lot of shooting or things with a lot of loud noises around your dogs, uh, it is worth the investment. Um, now, I will say a couple of things that I think the K9 helmet needs to improve, and they're already doing this with their M2 version. So the M2 version, which hasn't been officially released as far as I know, has a single lens, a lot more like the Rexpex uh, style and shape. Um, the Dark Systems also has the single lens. And, uh, and then Rexpex, of course, has the single lens. So your current K9 helmet has two um, lenses in the, the thing, but it, it is obvious if you work a dog on obstacles and things like that, that it, it does limit their field of view. So they have to use their head a lot more looking around to be able to see things. It does cut down on their peripheral vision. Uh, I think the single lens is going to help with that. So the, the uh, K9 helm M2 helmet that should be released soon, uh, or should be available to the public soon, um, may take care of a lot of these problems. But um, if you're doing a lot of work with your dog, that's something to keep in mind is there's a limit to um, the stuff. Okay, so yeah, my wife is taking care of me. So this is the new version of the Canine Helm. So these are the hearing protection pieces right here. And you basically pull that little thing off and there's this rubberized strap. I'm trying to make sure both of you guys can see it right here. And there's a little hook under there. Go away, spam risk. And so there's this little hook under here. And so what you do is you kind of pull it out from under that. It's not always easy. So you don't really do this with it on the dog's head. And then let's see if both of you guys can see that. This little hook right here hooks underneath the edge of the helmet here. And then the strap holds the bottom piece in. So these work really well. I really like these. Um, my lenses are out of this one right now, but you can see there's two separate lenses on these and so down here there's a little bit of loss of peripheral vision and then in between you know where the dogs would normally have binocular vision there's there's a section on both sides where they they lose a little bit of that depth perception and um it's not something they can't figure out and get used to it's just something that if you aren't having them wear it a lot um it will throw them off and so they need to practice with it and do things um, before you're having them do it an actual job wearing that helmet. So hopefully that answered your question there. Great Wolf Tactical. Um, Shield is up there too. I'm not sure. Not all these are in caps, so I just kind of scanned through them. Um, very interesting to incorporate obedience into play. Yeah. So when we're doing, I, I have obedience in everything with my dogs. My dogs are never, uh, well, Correction. The only time my dogs are out of obedience is if they're in a kennel run or on a tie out or in a crate. 
right? But they're contained in all three of those uh, instances. And if I allow them to truly just run around free, it's to test them to see, are they going to come back to me and, and come out of that and back into obedience as soon as I call them back, right? And if they fail, then they lose that. And, uh, and other than that, now when my dogs get about four or five years old, um, sometimes I'll just come here to the kennel and just let them run loose and I'll just go do other things, right? And I know they're going to stay close. Um, but even then, if I tell them to do something and they don't do it, guess what? They lose that freedom. So that's how I do. You can't hear on which one on the Instagram. I wonder if that call lost it. Yeah, I think when that call came through, we lost it. I am sorry about that. I need to remember to uh, turn on my do not disturb. Tracy, you can hear me on YouTube. Go to YouTube. I'm still good there. <laughs> Um, any interest in touching on people getting upset about physical punishment of the dogs and, um, tell her to leave it and come back in and see if it works. So, uh, okay. So when people complain and get upset about the physical punishment, it depends on what kind of dog you have, right? So if you, and, and what kind of dog you're trying to produce. So if you have, um, you know, a real docile relaxed dog and you're just trying to get a, a well-mannered pet that's okay you know it's easy to work with you don't need to use physical punishment you can use other things um, often with those dogs and they'll do just fine with it right so that's why i say there's no right or wrong way to train there is the best way for what you're trying to produce and for your particular dog um, if you have a malinois a working line german shepherd or a dutch shepherd and you do not incorporate some physical punishment, um, which we use the prong collar because I think it's the most humane and it's also the one of the easiest to use uh, once you learn how, then um, you have to have a negative consequence for certain behaviors. That's what you have to have. So physical punishment is you know, what some people are calling it, but it's basically, it's a correction, right? It's a, hey, don't do that again. And uh, because these dogs will sometimes do things you do not want them to do, and if you don't have a way to give them a negative consequence for that, then you can be in trouble. And uh, there you go, Tracy. Sorry you couldn't hear me on uh, Instagram. Um, I think it was the uh, the phone call that came through that lost my uh, signal there. So when you're doing um, uh, training and work with these dogs, you have to have a negative consequence. Now, there might be some other options, but even people who are swatting them on the butt or using like, you know, rolled up. Uh, newspaper or whatever it is they want to use, or even just the threat of force. And some dogs that are a little easier, um, you know, just thinking they're in trouble and, and like stepping toward them, like you're going to do something. Um, it's still a threat of force though, right? That, that's what that is. And so you have to have some way to bring a negative consequence for these dogs. And if you want a confident dog, um, you probably don't want this, like, I'm coming after you thing, because then your dog's going to back away whenever that happens, right? Um, the Using the prong collar correctly will still create a lot of confidence in the dogs. Um, the bottom line is, even if your dog is interested in treats and is bribed by treats and will do a lot of stuff for treats, there are going to be things that your dog wants to do that you do not want them to do. And treats don't help with that. that you have to have a negative consequence for that. So, um, you know, people that think that way, I basically just go, go away and, and go find somebody else, right? If, if you're not interested in that, um, like they don't always have to agree with us, uh, but if they're trying to get, like if somebody's trying to buy one of my puppies and they start talking that way, I'm like, yeah, yeah, bye-bye, go away. Because that dog's coming back to me in six months guaranteed and then I'm going to fix all your problems. So I'm not even, I don't even sell people those dogs. Now, not everybody uses our training method that gets our dogs, but um, it's just one of those things where, if I know that that's going to be the case, I just pretty much stay away. Um, we don't uh, we don't talk about Bruno. You guys are funny. Uh, anyone else lose audio? Okay. Uh, sorry about the audio. I am glad my wife was here today so she could tell me because I wasn't seeing it. And uh, so Tracy asked suggestions for displaced aggression. So correct me if I assume incorrectly here, Tracy. Uh, I am guessing this displaced aggression is... Um, they get aggressive toward one thing and then like another dog, one of you know their friends comes up, um, they turn and they uh, show that aggression to the friend. Uh, this is a, it's a common thing in dogs. So there's a couple things. Number one is recognizing what happens. And if that's not what you're talking about, Tracy, please let me know in the comments. 
But what it does is when dogs get amped up, they get a lot of aggression built up in their system. And then if there's nothing to let that aggression out on, uh, a lot of times when even a dog that they know and that they're friendly with comes up, sometimes that dog's getting amped up as well. And then they're like, we don't have anything to let this aggression out on. And they'll turn on each other. And if that happens, and sometimes it's real simple, it's real quick, like, rawr, 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 and then it's over. And other times it can turn into something um, pretty intense, right? So a couple of things. Number one is um, if you're in the house or in your yard, uh, my dogs aren't allowed to build that type of aggression. So if they're building that aggression because they're running up and down a fence, then my dog doesn't get to just go out in the backyard and run up and down the fence. Usually there's another dog on the other side of the fence, or maybe they're chasing cars up and down the front yard or something. If my dogs are doing that, they don't get to do that anymore. They don't get to go to that location and do that anymore. Um, so that's one. So I minimize the creating the aggression in the first place, right? If I'm in the house, um, especially if you have multiple males, multiple intact males, especially if I, I'm always watching those dogs. 99% of the time in my house, my dogs are in a place. They are not roaming around because when you have two intact males roaming around, they will often start to mark on things and, and it's a competition. I'm going to pee on it. Then the other dog's going to pee on it. And then I'm going to come back and pee on it again. And you end up having places in your house that you're getting marking in. And, um, and or they'll start to challenge each other a little bit. And they'll do these little, you know, posture things where they stand next to each other and they look at each other. As soon as I see my dogs behaving that way, I yell at them. Fooey that, knock it off, leave it alone, right? They're not allowed to start creating a pecking order among themselves. You're all dogs. I'm the human. That's that's our, our positioning. And uh, so that helps keep the aggression from happening in the first place. If you're out and about moving and some other dog comes and begins getting your dog amped up for some reason, um, this is when I use leave it, right? So I tell my dogs, leave it alone. I see it. Now, if that dog actually comes in and physically engages, I'm going to let my dogs defend themselves. And then I'm probably going to get involved in that situation somehow. Okay. But, um, and that could be using like a bear spray. That could be, if you have a taser, I guess you could try and use that. Um, you, you know, in worst case scenario, you could try to shoot the, the aggressing dog, but that becomes really hard when dogs are moving fighting, moving all fast together. Um, but there's a lot of things uh, that are possible, but I, I only allow them to engage if the other dog is already come and engaged on them, right? Other than that, it's leave it alone. I see it so that they're, you keep that aggression level low. Um, so, but all of those require you to have pretty good control over the dog in the first place and for them to have respect for your voice, which starts when they're young. If you start them when they're young and you keep them in discipline, then you're probably not going to have um, too much of a challenge with that it says yes the challenge uh, when they want to be close to me and it's all pretty quick so what I would do in that situation when they're trying to be close is either set yourself up in a way where one can be on one side and one can be on the other side um, or set them up in a way where if they're both gonna be at your feet they're looking away and then I would deliberately while they're in obedience show a bunch of attention to one tell the other one you leave it and stay there I'm showing attention to this one and then after I'm done, I come over and I tell the one I was just petting, you leave it and stay there. And I pet the other one, right? So they're not getting up. And if in the first, if you haven't done this before, when you first start to do it, they're going to break position. When they break position, they get a correction and get put back, right? And then that way um, they're learning, listen, I'm going to touch whichever one of you I want to pet at the time. And you're not allowed to get upset with the other dog over it. And you, this is why I tell people you can pet your dog as much as you want, but you never let the dog decide when it gets petted. You decide when you're going to pet your dog and you decide when you're not going to pet your dog. And if my dog comes to me and asks to be pet, I go, no, go back to your spot and lay down. I decide when you want to get pet because when you have two dogs like this, one gets up and goes, I want to get pet. And the other one goes, oh no, no, I want to get pet. And then they're pushing each other, trying to get your attention. Right. And that then can escalate. So if they're in obedience and discipline, laying in their places, not permitted to get up and ask to be pet, I'll pet them when I want to pet them, then, and that doesn't mean you don't get to pet your dog, pet them all you want, but you decide when to pet them. You don't let them decide when they get pet and you'll minimize a lot of those problems. So hopefully that's helpful there, Tracy. And um, so I think that's everything. Um, I will try to remember next time to um, do not disturb myself. When I start these on the Instagram side, uh, I probably need to start making a little like checklist for myself, you know, close your windows, do this, do that. 
um, so that I don't end up with problems. I've had that happen a couple of times and I'm still learning this whole live stream thing. So I hope that's been helpful for you guys. Um, if you would like to contact me, uh, if you have questions, you want to send an email like I uh, read at the beginning of this one uh, and answer your questions, you can email me at joel, J-O-E-L, at fortressk9.com. Uh, that is F-O-R-T-R-E-S-S, -S, the letter K, the number nine.com. Remember, K9 in any of my stuff is the letter K and the number nine. Uh, please check out our websites, Fortress K9 uh, for trained dogs, Fortress K9. I'm sorry, FortressK9.com for trained dogs. FortressK9.com slash puppies, forward slash puppies, uh, is our puppy page, and you can find out information on how to get our puppies there. And uh, K9AcademyOnline.com is where you can get our online training uh, and uh, connect with us as well uh, for coming to some of our in-person training if you want to do that. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, Odyssey is the uh, censorship-resistant version of YouTube. Uh, MeWe is the censorship-resistant version of Facebook. And Float, F-L-O-T-E, is the censorship-resistant version of Instagram, as far as I'm concerned. It's kind of like a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter meld together. Um, I'm not really on Twitter. I have an account and stuff goes over there, but I never go over and check anything. I guess apparently I'm streaming there. So if you're on Twitter, come follow me on my other platforms and you can actually interact with this there. Um, please like us over there. Please tell your friends about us. Please tell your friends about our podcast. It's really, really helpful. Uh, it helps us get our uh, followers up. And uh, if there's a place to rate us and review us, please give us a five-star rating, write us a good review. And remember, if you're interested in getting a working line um, puppy, contact me. I have German Shepherd Malinois Crosses, which if you've never had a German Shepherd Malinois Cross, they are awesome dogs. Uh, they have a little bit more of the mellowness of the German Shepherd and the thoughtfulness um, and a lot of the benefits of the Malinois as well. So they are a, a really good cross to do. And, uh, and this was a, um, a really good breeding. I'm really pleased with these two dogs. I didn't want it to happen when it happened, but it was a breeding I had planned anyway. And so we have available puppies from that. And with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Remember, until next time, train hard and stay safe. And I'm going to end. That was the end of the recording. Hello, Anna. If you're just getting on um, the very beginning of this live stream, uh, well, I do a little intro and then I do your uh, email there pretty much right off the bat. So um, if you want to go up and uh, hear my reply there, uh, you can definitely do that. And um, one of the things I did mention in there is if you've already got your puppy lined up and all squared away, that's great. But I do have puppies available if you want to get one of our dogs. And, um, and if you're in Canada, I would encourage you to check out Baden Canine, B-A-D-E-N canine and i will um it's okay this is this should save on facebook but if it doesn't on youtube on the um on the the fortress canine page on youtube um i know it saves i think it has to do a little render process after i end it and then it'll be up there for you to watch uh and it's also over on instagram although i may have lost my audio at the end of the instagram thing because i got a phone call that came in so several people were telling me they can't hear me on instagram anymore all right um but I can also, um, when I end this, I'll try and hop over to YouTube and get the link and, uh, and I'll see if I can't throw that in there um, for you. I'll try and send that to you on text. All right. Uh, I will see you guys later. And uh, remember next Thursday, I'm going to do my best uh, to do this. I may, let's see, next Thursday, I'm actually going to be in Texas. I should be able to do this. I'll be at a, a house with Wi-Fi. So I should be able to do my live stream next Thursday, assuming I have good connection. Uh, the last time I tried it, though, I was too far from the router at my other client's house, and it just wasn't um, that good a thing. Uh, but then the next Thursday, I, sh I may or may not be home. If I'm not, I can probably do it from the road. Um, but I may only be able to do Instagram if I'm doing it from the road. So hopefully that, um, that'll happen one way or another. And then after that, we're back on our regular schedule for quite a while. All right, guys, I will see you guys next week, hopefully.